It's Monday, November 28th, 2011, and this is For Good Reason. Welcome to For Good Reason. I'm DJ Grothy. This shows the radio show and the podcast produced in association with the James Randi Educational Foundation, a nonprofit whose mission is to advance critical thinking about the paranormal, pseudoscience, and the supernatural. My guest this week is James Randi. He's a world renowned magician and skeptic and investigator of paranormal claims. He's had a central role in the development of the worldwide skeptical movement, which the James Randi Educational Foundation supports. He's perhaps best known for issuing a million-dollar challenge to a number of paranormal claimants around the world, especially the celebrity psychics. He's appeared very widely in the media, including on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show at least 22 times, and has been a regular on Penn & Teller's old Showtime series, Bullshit. He's received a number of recognitions, including a MacArthur Genius Grant, and the Forum Award from the American Physical Society for promoting the public understanding of the relation of physics to society. He's the author of a number of books, including Truth About Uri Geller, and also The Faith Healers, Flim Flam, and an encyclopedia of claims, frauds, and hoaxes of the occult and supernatural. Randy, welcome back to For Good Reason. Always good to be here, DJ. Uh, Randy, we have a lot of new listeners to the show, so uh, if you don't mind, let's start off with the basics. The James Randi Educational Foundation. We push being skeptical. We say skepticism is a good thing to be. You've been named actually the leading skeptic of the 20th century. So to begin, let's just start off with what the heck is skepticism? Well, let's not um, mistake it. Uh, there, there can be a confusion here. A lot of people who are cynical think that they're they're skeptical. They may also be skeptical, but cynicism is not skepticism at all. Uh, skepticism, and I don't think we have to go back to the Greek roots of it, skeptos and whatnot. It, it is simply insisting that evidence be offered for claims, particularly claims that are not likely to be true. Uh, claims of flying saucers and uh, and dowsing with sticks to find oil underground and, and things like that, oil and water, or lost children or whatever. Uh, these are claims that are unlikely to be true, and I think they deserve skepticism by their very nature. Now, that doesn't mean a cynic would say, oh, no, there's no such thing, I don't want to talk about it, and they just walk away from it. And the cynic also... Uh, ascribes uh, ulterior motives to people who believe these things or who push them. And it may just be ignorance. It, it may just be lack of sophistication that makes people accept these things or leads them to accept these things. So skepticism has to be thought of as not cynicism. Uh, and I think we should never let that uh, enter our our spectrum of, of thought and activity. And I certainly don't let it uh, enter mine whatsoever and the James Randi Educational Foundation should be devoted to skepticism uh, as defined as I've just described it, I believe. So skepticism is a kind of open-minded inquiry. That's what you're getting at. That's uh, right. Bertrand Russell has this great line, you know, you should believe only those things for which there's adequate evidence. That's what uh, you just said. But yep. to me, that seems sort of uncontroversial. So if skepticism is just thinking critically about things, only believing stuff for which there's adequate evidence – doesn't everyone actually buy into that sort of skepticism? I mean, I can't imagine anyone who actually promotes the value of being gullible. Everyone, even the, you know, even the person who says she believes in UFOs, you know, you often hear these people say, well, I'm a skeptic. I only believe this because of the evidence. Well, let's get into the definition of evidence. Uh, this seems to be the, uh, uh, the operating word here. What is evidence? Uh, now that we've, we've tried to tell our folks uh, what skepticism is, and it's proven by evidence, uh, uh, that is, it can be examined using evidence only, um, then the definition of evidence uh, comes into view, and that's perhaps a little more difficult to arrive at. Um, evidence is something that stays no matter how much you examine it, no matter how much you 
you test it and you tease it and try to pull it apart and negate it and uh, and, and defy it and whatnot, it remains there. Uh, four plus four equals eight, if uh, I remember my arithmetic properly, and I believe I do. Now, you can test that by taking four cantaloupes and four Volkswagens and put them in a huge box and mix them up. Now, the cantaloupes won't do too well in, in the mixing, I'm sure. But if you count them afterwards, if you can pick out the, the pieces, there are still four plus four, which equals eight. There are eight objects in that box. And I don't know how I came up with cantaloupes and Volkswagens. I have no idea whatsoever, but that's the way my evil mind works. <laughs> but uh, that that is a thing you can test again and again and again, and it will never give you a different result. So that four objects, distinct objects, added to four other distinct objects will always result in a total of eight. So... Uh, that, that that would would constitute good evidence for me, but evidence has to be something that can be tested that way. No, not that simply or or simplistically, I should say. Uh, no, there's sometimes it's much more difficult to examine evidence. But we've got to uh, take some lessons in uh, examining uh, evidence, I think, and that's one thing that the JRF has promoted for years. Uh, how do you know that something is true? How do you examine evidence for it? And we frequently run into the the problem, and we offer solutions. So it seems like you're touching on the point that uh, the evidence needs to be objective, independently verifiable. There's this notion of intersubjectivity. So, you know, various people could have the same experience of uh, the evidence as well. You know, so it's not just a matter of taste or personal preference or one man's hidden or occult or secret knowledge, but that it's open to everyone's objective scrutiny. And one thing that we find all the time, too, and I'm sure you've run into it, DJ, well, we've all run into it, is people who say, oh, I just know that's true. I don't know. I don't have, I don't have, I don't need evidence. I I, know. I don't want to see that. I don't know. I don't want to see the page number. No, no, I don't want to see the book. Close that book. No, that's not necessary. I just know that what I just told you is true. And that is not just knowing. That is uh, wishful thinking in many cases. Now, it may be true. The uh, the premise that's, that's being examined here may be true. But just knowing it is not sufficient. And many people can't follow that, and they don't follow that. They uh, They seem to think that they've got some sort of inner knowledge or inspired knowledge. And, of course, all relig- religious claims are exactly... Uh, that sort of thing. There is no evidence for religious claims. Uh, there are There is evidence for certain claims that may be dubbed uh, religious, but when it's, uh, they're examined carefully, uh, they either don't apply to religion or they aren't true. So y- you touched on religion, and I'd like to get into that a, a bit more later, you know, whether or not God is within the purview, you know, claims of God's existence well within the purview of this ki- the kind of skepticism you're talking about. But let's stay on this uh, evidence notion. So skepticism is believing only those things for which there's good evidence, and evidence is this kind of knowledge arrived at through observation, right, that right, is right. objective. It's not just a matter of personal preference or taste. And right. all of this sounds kind of scientific. You know, this is the language scientists use. Yes, oh, it is. Uh, uh, well, the the actual, I, I would say, uh, is somewhat more accurately that mathematics is the language of science. But the the premises of science are all based upon uh, the gathering and uh, evaluation of evidence and coming to a conclusion based upon that evaluation. Mm. Uh, But uh, you're absolutely right. No, science uh, is a logical, rational process, and uh, it can be the the experiments that either prove or disprove uh, a premise in science can be arrived at many different ways. In fact, there are many different ways of establishing each one of those uh, premises. Uh, and we would take days of, <laughs> of evaluation here uh, uh, on these microphones trying to, um, trying to define that, I guess, and to limit it. But it is pretty well limitless. There are so many ways to come uh, to a conclusion, a conclusion based upon reason, rationality, and, if you will, mathematics, uh, and if they don't agree, then there's something wrong with at least one of them, and there's something wrong with the process of reasoning. What, skepticism 
is continuous with the methods, the processes of science. They're all of a piece. And that's why not only do you have some magicians being skeptics, but you have scientists. You know, they're, they're the group of people that we look to to kind of push this sort of skepticism. The James Randi Educational Foundation holds up. Yeah, of course. And uh, uh, science is, is something that so many people are afraid of. They say, oh, he's talking science again. Click. And that's the, the end of the, uh, of the listening in. Uh, this is this is very frightening uh, to me that people will turn away from it when they hear the word science brought in. But science is a logical, rational way of, of approaching problems in the world. It's not a mysterious thing. It's not a religion itself. It it has uh, very strict uh, rules and such. And uh, any scientist that steps outside those those rules and and adopts the attitude, and I've heard of many of them who do. Uh, that uh, oh we need to investigate that this is this is acknowledged. Well, I want to know whether it's acknowledged or not. Uh, you know, is that really the square root of sixteen point four or whatever? Yeah, moving on then, uh, really about the specific focus of the JREF, you know, we're not a science education organization only. We don't teach people astronomy or, or biology, etc. We support scientific literacy, but we focus on the paranormal, on pseudoscience in particular. Why that focus? Why not just be pro-science in general? Well, uh, science itself is pro-science. There are many, many agencies and many individuals, many groups out there that are handling uh, scientific problems and coming to conclusions via uh, scientific means. But the JREF is much more dedicated to those very highly questionable uh, things that really amount in many cases to nothing more than superstition or fond ideas that people would like to be true. And those things are very dangerous. They're insidious in that they can separate people uh, from their sanity, for, for one thing, and certainly separate them from their from their money. And uh, I think that that is the, the major job of the James Randi Educational Foundation, that is to inform people that there may be alternate answers to the questions they're, they're asking, if they're asking any questions at all, and to be very, very wary of what you find on uh, apparently uh, definitive and authoritative and dependable sources. Now, uh, that doesn't apply to Google, of course, because Google, as we know, knows everything in the world. There's no question of that. <laughs> but uh, you, you notice that Google entries and such, and... Uh, they they are subject to correction and uh, by either by readers or or whatever um, agencies of various kinds. You've got to be very careful of accepting the corrections as well. So we are faced with a matter of judgment, and there is such a thing as good common sense, DJ. It does exist. There's no question of it. I hear people saying, "Oh, that's just an expression." Old ladies use that. Oh, it's just common sense. Well, it may uh, be. Is something for little old ladies to handle, but little old ladies sometimes know a lot, and we better listen to them too. Common sense is an actual thing. It's something. Well, first of all, it appeals to the intellect. It appeals to the to the rationality of people. But very uh, commonly, very often, common sense can be wrong if it's based upon the wrong premises and the wrong education, the wrong background. And certainly a religious background is going to lead people to uh, come to very strange conclusions. In many cases, if uh, their religion is so much a part of their philosophy that they cannot deny it and they, they use it first before they use anything else. Look at the, uh, the, the candidates for the position of president of the United States that we've been seeing on TV. Mm. Uh, it is incredible. Hardly any of them can say uh, anything in saying good night or goodbye then God bless you, or God bless the so-and-so party or whatever. Uh, and that party has a lot of so-and-sos in it, but we won't get into that. Um, yeah, that that is such a pervasive thing, this belief first in religion and then on logic and science and rationality. This is a very dangerous way to go. So I hear you saying that we focus on the paranormal, on pseudoscience in particular, because uh, one, we're doing it in the public interest, two, there aren't really a lot of other organizations that focus on that. So we're filling a niche, and it's primarily because these beliefs are harmful. It's not just 
that we go after nonsense beliefs when they're trivial. We focus on this stuff because they can harm you in the ways you mentioned, separate you from your money, from your sanity, that kind of lead you to being gullible and deceived by, you know, scurrilous people. Uh, so yep. the point is, it's the harm issue. Well, you know, I, I have constant proof of the value of the JRF, and I'm not speaking about my personal value at all. Uh, I have a certain amount of that I I, uh, I maintain, a certain amount. I, I'm not, <laughs> not scratching my own back here, but I must say that I get email every day, I get letters every day, I get phone calls uh, every day. Information comes to me from people out there who literally say this kind of thing. You know, until I read your book, so-and-so, or until I heard you on so-and-so, until I read this out of the other thing on Swift, uh, I, I rather doubted uh, that you were barking up a tree that had a raccoon in it. But by golly, I think you do. And uh, look closely at that tree, and there are lots of raccoons up there. So uh, let's go after them. Uh, I get letters of encouragement like this from people who are saying, you made a great difference in my life. And at the amazing meetings, the TAMs, as we call them, TAMs. These are the annual conferences that the James Randi Educational Foundation puts on. The one in Vegas this last summer attracted 1,672 people from all yep. over the world. Yeah, At 35 countries, remember that. Right, right. Yeah, not, we didn't attract the whole country, but <laughs> we attracted people from 35 countries, uh, internationally speaking. But no, the the position that we have to take in these things, uh, the the viewpoint from which we see them, uh, from our position uh, as skeptics, as uh, sort of standing back from the whole thing, is there are people suffering out there, and those are the people who write me when they've received some relief from something that we've said, something we've published, or something that occurred at a TAM, and that happens so often at at TAMs. You and I have both had the experience of being stopped in the halls by somebody who looks a little hesitant but uh, wants to, to buttonhole you or me or any of our uh, personnel, of course, and just say, I, I just want to thank you. You know, you changed my mind about so-and-so. And at that point, DJ, and I'm sure you do it too, I will examine it further with them and say, now, are you sure that what we said about this subject is more definitive than what you firmly understood. And I, I would like to thrash it out with them a little bit because I don't want anybody to start believing what I say simply because it's me saying it and because I write books and because I make a lot of public appearances and TV and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not a good reason. The good reason is the, the, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting of it. So taste that pudding before you accept it. If a skeptic is a skeptic because of the authority of James Randi, that's not a very good reason. No, not a good reason at all. Right. Randi, some folks, not just at our amazing meetings uh, or at the grassroots when we put on workshops or events all over the country, but online and elsewhere, they've argued, especially a, a bit more recently, that progressive social issues, say, like gay rights or civil rights, income inequality, maybe some environmentalism issues or issues surrounding feminism or sexism, that these issues are much more important than the kinds of topics you just talked about that the JREF focuses on, you know, the, the paranormal and pseudoscience. Uh, they seem to argue we should be focusing on those things more than, you know, the trivial stuff, the things that go bump in the night. Well, I disagree with that uh, very strongly, DJ, because we have our expertise. My specialty, obviously, as a magician is that I know how tricks are done, and we're examining... Uh, uh, instances and, and situations where people are being tricked. So there are people out there who talk about the environment all the time. As individuals and huge uh, groups of people, organizations that do this all the time, and the gay issues and, and the existence or non-existence of God and such, all of these things are being handled already. But the thing that people find so attractive is this paranormal, supernatural, uh, occult sort of a thing, and it's insidious. That, that's something that we have to specialize in going after because that's where our strength is. And I don't want to get spread out too thin. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll be talking about the, the, the price of uh, Pepto-Bismol or whatever <laughs> at the local drugstore and, and arguing over the thing and finding whether it's fair and just. It, it's, it's bad enough to have homeopathic medicines <laughs> mm -hmm. in drugstores now, but we don't want to spread our talents too thin. I think the JRF is uh, where it is, uh, and, and properly so, 
because of its specialization. I hear you saying that an organization that tries to do everything ends up doing nothing well. So we have our focus, our unique qualifications to focus on the paranormal, on pseudoscience, given your background and the expertise, the background of the JREF staff. You know, we're, we're almost unique among organizations with this laser-like focus on pseudoscience and the paranormal and investigating those sorts of claims in the public interest. And not only not only that, TJ. Uh, I the as I said a bit earlier, the feedback I get from people, uh, either at a meeting or at a lecture that I do, or um, as a result of a television show or a radio broadcast, or even uh, here on the internet, uh, the reaction I get from people shows that that's the right way to go. Mm. People do appreciate it, and they do benefit from it. It's a service which is needed. It's certainly not trivial when someone... I was in the Midwest with you at one of your talks, and no exaggeration, a young man came up to you, and I mean, this is going to sound a little cult of personality, but he teared up as he was talking to you about how your work has changed his life for the better. You know, some people go around in a cloud of gullibility and they stumble upon James Randi, whether it's our YouTube channel or your writings or your public appearances, and they kind of, their light bulbs go off and uh, they are really benefited from this new kind of skeptical perspective. So I've seen that firsthand. I've seen people with shaky, quivering voices come up to you and thank you for changing their lives. Well, they're thanking, in the long run, they're thanking the JREF, because this is an organization of people. It's not just me. I happen to be the figurehead out there, and I do have a very attractive beard. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that that all adds up. So you, you can't deny that. But they're not necessarily thanking me personally. They're thanking the fact that the JREF exists. And the JREF, when it came into existence, I thought, oh, this is going to take an awful lot of work off my back. (laughs) Wrong. (laughs) It is just uh, meant that I have to work harder and and faster and longer uh, in order to get the same sort of things done. But I've got good people like you, uh, for example, uh, working – uh, with me on these problems and, and Sadie and all the rest of them. I, I better not start naming names or someone will get left out along the line. But, uh, you know, the things that uh, that everyone connected with the JREF has done um, reflect on the organization and they don't reflect on me at all. Well, I, th- I think a lot of people are inspired by the, your decades of work, your continuing work exposing these charlatans kind of in the public interest you're exposing frauds to help people out because undue credulity in these harmful paranormal claims well it it hurts people to believe the nonsense and that's what gets your ire up randy earlier uh you mentioned religion you mentioned god uh let's just touch on that real quick we kind of get it from both ends this is not a dirty joke here but if you're getting it from both ends you must be doing something right because we have (laughs) atheist uh folks who uh really get mad at the jref for not solely focusing on the God belief. And we have religious supporters. There are a number of religious supporters who say, I love what the JREF does. Yes, I believe, say, in the salvific power of Jesus or something, but I love that JREF exposes the charlatans, the fake faith healers, etc. And we've, we have not only religious supporters, but you have some religious allies. There are religious skeptics who have worked in common cause with the JREF. And so we kind of cast a, a wide net in that way. We're a big tent organization. There's no statement of non-beliefs you have to sign in order to support um, right. the work that we do. Point, point is, we get it from both sides. But two groups are saying, you're not enough of X uh, to please me. The atheists say you're not atheist enough, and the religious people say, some of them anyway, you're too atheistic. So where do you come out? Uh, is the JREF an atheist organization, or are we just like an organization with atheist staff? No, we are not specifically an atheist organization. I am a devoted atheist. I always say an atheist of the second kind because Webster's Dictionary, one of them that I have here, gives two definitions of uh, uh, atheism. Uh, The first one says the philosophy that says there is no deity. And the second uh, definition, or not definition, but uh, usage uh, in in this particular Webster says someone who does not find sufficient evidence 
uh, to make a convincing case for the existence of a deity. So you're a uh, skeptic of God's existence, like you're a skeptic, say, of ghosts' existence. You haven't exactly. found sufficient evidence. Uh, it's not that you know there is no God. It's that you don't believe there is a God because there ain't no good evidence. That's right. That's right. And you show me good evidence, and I am willing to change my mind. Mind you, it's going to have to be very good evidence, uh, not because of my particular a cut of mind, of course. Uh, at least I hope not. It's just that I have examined this since I was a tiny child. I remember uh, at, at the age of eight and nine having arguments with babysitters, uh, some of whom were uh, evangelical types who used to uh, mind me and my brother and sister um, <laughs> when my parents went out at, at night to the theater or whatever. And uh, I would give them a, a very bad, a very good argument, pardon me, and they'd consider it a bad argument because the devil had gotten into, uh, in touch with my tongue somehow, you see. And they would complain to my parents when they came home, oh, this child is, is dreadful. He, he argues about the existence of angels, uh, for example. And uh, so I, I've had my experience of this from a very, very early age. I must say my parents never tried to really sell me on religion. Uh, they were Anglicans, which is sort of watered down Catholic in Canada, <laughs> and and uh, I, I, they're going to love that. I can just hear people groaning now. But um, they, they never really tried to sell me on religion. Uh, I, I'm sure I told you my episode of going to Sunday school. You have mentioned it. Mention it again for our listeners. Oh, all right. Very briefly then, because I, I tell my stories over and over again. I'm an old guy, you know. Uh, we tend to do that. Uh, yeah, I, they sent me to Sunday school, and uh, they were still abed on a Sunday morning, and they'd uh, give me a quarter, which was to put into the offering plate, so to speak. And... Uh, they would send me off to Sunday school. I went the first time and got into arguments with the teachers right away. Uh, how do you know that's true? It's in this book. Oh, well, I mean, who wrote that book? God wrote this book, and, and Jesus wrote this book, etc. Well, I wasn't too convinced by that argument, and I went the second week, and I, I gave in the quarter, incidentally, but I, I went the second week, and uh, on that uh, episode, anyway, I went the second week, and I was finally thrown out of the class because I was making a lot of trouble. And the other kids were not listening to what the teacher was saying. Uh, they were listening more to me. So I was tossed out. And the third week, I discovered this wonderful fact, which I've never forgotten and I've never quite gotten over. The 25 cents at Purdy's Drugstore on Bayview Avenue in Toronto would buy a two-flavor uh, ice cream sundae in a tall tulip dish. And that was a delight. It was much better than Sunday school. I can tell you that. <laughs> Uh, well, there you go, proving those fundamentalist Christians right. You're just a materialistic, in both senses of the term, atheist who who cared more about the here and now than the there and then. There you go. Proud, and proudly so, proudly so. Okay, so the JREF is not an atheist organization. You said that, no. but you're also a super big atheist yourself. Square that circle for me. Make sense out of this notion that we're not an atheist organization, but uh, I think almost all of us are atheists. Well, I'm, I'm willing to argue with anyone, discuss the, the matter, if you will, about the existence of a God. Uh, and I have done this at various uh, meetings, lectures, uh, and after lectures that I have uh, presided at over the years. Um, I will argue the matter, and um, I won't give much ground on it. Uh, and if they find they throw up their hand to say, well, there's no sense arguing with you, that's the best words I hear in the whole day, <laughs> uh, because that means I'm finished with that one. Uh, and there is no point in arguing with somebody uh, who insists that evidence be produced to support any premise, and that is what I insist on doing, or I don't argue. Uh, where is your evidence? Do you have any, first of all? And if so, where is it, and how strong is it? And let's discuss it. So I'm willing to do that at all times. I think that the God delusion, and that's what I call the chapter in my forthcoming book, A Magician in the Laboratory, which I'm sure you'll all rush out and buy several copies of as soon as it's published. <laughs> um, the, the God delusion is the name of that particular chapter. And uh, it, it deals, it's a long chapter, I, I will admit, in my forthcoming book. But it is an important thing because so much of the misinformation that we have and the lack of, uh, of reasoning and rationality that uh, pervades our society is attributable uh, to religion. And look at wars. 
look at the recent wars, look at wars back through history. The reason that most of these wars took off as they did is because of religious differences. Examine them carefully, and you'll find that that's very true. I, I Look think at, that's true even in the 20th century, but only if you define religion to include state religions like yes. Nazism or, or exactly. St- Stalinism, communism, something. Um, so the chapter in your book, The God Delusion, should also be said that that's the title of uh, one of our favorite books written by – Richard Dawkins, uh, oh, yes. God Delusion. Uh, you, you zero in on God belief as as a topic well within the purview of the skeptical enterprise. Mm-hmm. Very true. Very true. I, I, so I, I maintain that this is, to my mind, and, and in my estimation, and in my philosophy, it is the greatest cause of misunderstanding of reality uh, th- that is the the existence of religion because it's basically, in my estimation again, it's basically wrong and it can govern people to the point where they don't admit anything that doesn't uh, admit, admit anything to their philosophy or their reasoning uh, processes if it doesn't embrace religion as well. And I think that is a leading mistake. And so this is something that uh, the JREF does focus on, but it's mm-hmm. not our only focus, and we don't zero in on solely on on God belief or church state separation or something you mentioned the reason why earlier um, I, I want to go over that again you're, you're saying it's because other organizations do that that's their focus and we have a niche focus when it comes to these testable claims these right. these paranormal or religious claims where we can get in there and examine them so you're talking about religion or these kind of supernatural belief systems governing one's life a new age believer or a believer in psychics or a believer in a f- some fundamentalist religious creed, it, that's a worldview. It kind of covers all the bases in his or her life. And consequently, it kind of makes skepticism unable to kind of penetrate that un- unless the person gets open-minded enough to start examining this, that, or the other belief. Correct. And I must say that I have, uh, in many cases, uh, led people from um – <laughs> from their religious point of view to uh, to the point where religion only colors but does not rule their thinking process. And because I believe if we can get them to that point, uh, just having a, a coloration in their thinking process, that pretty soon that color gets fainter and fainter and pretty soon is called transparency. Mm. I like that turn of phrase. I should also say, I don't know, uh, I'm not trying to pick a fight, but I sometimes feel I have even more in common with a liberal religious person than, you know, some diehard atheist who happens to be homophobic and sexist and racist and kind of believes in alt-med and denies the moon landing and all that other stuff. So atheism to me is not enough. I tend to favor a skeptic who more broadly applies skepticism in many areas of his or her life rather than just kind of being a one-note Johnny and only ever talking the God belief. Yes, I, I would tend to agree with you on that, DJ. Uh, I, I tend that way too, but I get into some different arguments than you might, and so the approach and the result will be somewhat different. Right. Uh, so to finish up, Randy, uh, you, you're talking about the focus of the JREF, the work that we do. We've talked about how you know we've both seen people come up to you about how the work of the JREF and your work has changed their lives. Under your leadership the last couple of years, we've undertaken a number of new projects. Let's finish up by highlighting a couple of those for our new Please, listeners. Please, yes. First of all, uh, the, the record attendance that we had at the last uh, at TAM in Las Vegas there, I think we can be very justly proud of that. Uh, you know, 1,672 people. That's, that's a huge crowd. <laughs> but we have been doing uh, things that, uh, well, for example, uh, we sponsored that, uh, what they called the 1023, it should be 10 to the 23rd power. I'm, I'm a stickler on that. Uh, the anti-homeopathy campaign. We were the U.S. sponsors of that anti-homeopathy campaign, and you issued a challenge, actually, to yes. the, oh, yes. the pharmacies uh, yeah. who peddled that stuff. Yeah, and, you know, <laughs> when I've actually gotten to talk to somebody in the pharmacy business, they just throw up their hands uh, with no shame whatsoever, and say, yes, but people want to buy it. You know, and then, then my, my 
my response to that, of course, is, oh, you will sell heroin then if they want it, and, and they will pay the money for it. And they say, oh, no, 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 that's against the law. Oh, then it's a case of if it's still legal and you can still get away with it, you'll do it because it makes you money. Mm. And at that point, the conversation usually stops rather abruptly. So we sponsored that national campaign. We issued the million-dollar paranormal challenge to the claimants of homeopathy. But we also issued the million-dollar challenge to a number of other folks this year. Yes, we did indeed. (laughs) Some specific people. Uh, James Von Prague hasn't been heard much of lately. Notice? (laughs) Well, DJ, why don't you tell us about the project that that, that you uh, did on behalf of the uh, the JRF, of course, with your zombies? We had fun with, uh, and, and this is on our YouTube channel, which is one of the most subscribed nonprofit YouTube channels in all of YouTube history. There will be a link to it on our website, forgoodreason.org. Uh, Randy, we got a group of JREF volunteers here in Southern California to do a, I don't know, would it be called a zombie flesh mob? Maybe that, maybe flesh mob <laughs> means something else. But um, we basically crashed one of James Von Prague's parties, took careful attention not to be disruptive of the of the proceedings or to challenge or confront any of the attendees because remember these folks who go to see James Von Prague, he's one of these psychic mediums who says he could talk to deceased relatives. Well, they're going because they're grieving. They've just lost a loved one. I think what James Von Prague does, it it offends both reason and the conscience when you think of how, well, uh, from my vantage, he's taking advantage of the grieving of the bereaved and it's ugly. It's gross to me. So, uh, rather than just kind of trying to st- stick it to them, we uh, issued them a million dollar challenge. We won some national press attention for that million dollar challenge, but of course he ignored that challenge. So we said, if he says he could talk to dead people and he won't talk to the James Randi Educational Foundation, we'll bring some dead people to his spirit circle where he makes tens of thousands of dollars a night pretending, I think, pretending to talk to people's dead loved ones. Well, we brought some zombies, some dead people, to see if he would talk talk to us. And, of course, he didn't. But that little stunt, and we're unapologetic about it being a stunt. Look, we, we're trying to raise the public's awareness about these irresponsible, harmful claims that people like James Von Prague make. Um, well, it garnered national media attention in the LA Times and Forbes in uh, it, uh, AOL News, a number of places. And uh, w- wouldn't you know, uh, shortly after that zombie flesh mob, or whatever we want to call it, James Von Prague changed his policy. And on his website now, he has an ironclad policy, I think, in an attempt to keep more things like this from happening. So Pretty evidently, I believe. Right. So th- th- you're right. That's one thing we did. But we uh, had fun doing a number of other things this year. Uh, you literally traveled the world giving talks uh, in a number of countries, as an example. Uh, well, with Brian Thompson, my faithful assistant, uh, we traveled uh, all over Europe, for one thing. And, uh, well, I did that with Sadie Crabtree, of course. And then when we got back here, I, I went right across Canada from Vancouver uh, all the way to Halifax, and that's from west to east, and you, you can't really miss anything along the way. That was a nine-city lecture tour to sold-out audiences throughout Canada. Yes, that was nine cities in nine days. That's the most important part of it. We had one day extra in Halifax, and uh, they, they sort of hung me up on the clothesline and just let me hang there for 24 hours. Uh, I was totally exhausted by it. Uh, but it, it was good work. It was such good work because we met all kinds of enthusiastic people in another country. That's my original uh, birth country, of course, as you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was happy to be there. But uh, the the media attention, the, the, the amount of uh, press we got on the thing, the amount of attention, and as you say, the turnaway crowds in every case uh, was really something. Uh, it was very, very... It was a good move on on behalf of the JRF, and I was very proud to be at the head of that. You also gave talks in Spain, um, and you mentioned uh, the Norway tour. You were Mm -hmm. a national spokesperson for uh, anti-superstition and anti 
uh, paranormal campaign there in cooperation with the National Humanist Organization in Norway. So the point is, you literally were ev- everywhere this year. You were on the road a lot. Uh, we also did a number of things this year. You mentioned TAM, uh, your speaking tours, but we also appointed a number of new research fellows. Yeah, uh, and research fellows are very handy to have around because they can take up some of the slack when you've got other things to do. Tim Farley and Kyle Hill. Now, Dr. Ray Hall, there, there's a find right there, and senior fellow Dr. Stephen Novella. Now, we've been connected and attached to Stephen Novella, of course, uh, Dr. Novella, I should say, for quite some time, but he's now a senior fellow of the JRF, and uh, he heads up the uh, our new science-based medicine project, which is important because um, medical uh, quackery, I think, is a very, very important uh, subject that the JRF deals with. And when you're talking about harm, that's a, a perfect example of how undue credulity harms people. If you have your appendix rupture and you go to a quack doctor, uh, you'll die, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, so, yes. In many cases, you will, sure. Uh, I know way back you uh, debunked, you exposed, sorry, the psychic surgeons. When you look at folks like Peter Sellers or Andy Kaufman, both of these men had cancer and they went to psychic surgeons instead of oncologists and they died as a result. Yeah, and Kaufman himself uh, actually reported after seeing them in their performance, he saw exactly how it was being done and he found himself laughing on the operating table. And this man was dying and he died shortly after that, as a matter of fact. Mm. Uh, these people are, well, they're they're just heartless. They're using their position as apparent physicians and or magicians uh, to deceive these people. And you wouldn't think that someone like Peter Sellers or Andy Kaufman would fall for this sort of thing, but they do. Or even a more contemporary example, there's speculation that Steve Jobs uh, yes. may have increased the likelihood of his death from pancreatic cancer because of his belief in alt-med practices. Yes, I believe that's true. And uh, if, you, if you had the intellect of a Steve Jobs and you full, still fall for this sort of thing, I, I think that's, that's an object lesson for us here. We've got to uh, step up our resources and our, our activities. We've done very well in this last year, though, DJ, and we should be very proud of it. Mm. So I know one thing that you're really excited about is our new effort to digitally publish uh, important works of skepticism, including many of your titles. Oh, yes, indeed, because uh, this is the way to go. I'm sure that the forests are sighing uh, in relief knowing that uh, they're not going to be chopped down as uh, viciously as they have been in past years uh, just to supply paper so that that can be thrown away in the garbage as well. Uh, I think that the the whole digital thing is so important uh, nowadays. It is taking over everywhere and I'm happy to see it. And so the the real goal here also, and in, in addition to the environmental interests that you just mentioned, is that we hope to reach new audiences with uh, these ebooks for the iPad, for the Kindle, and Nook. Uh, so your books, Flim Flam, Faith Healers, Truth About Uri Geller, your encyclopedia of uh, claims of the paranormal, a uh, number of new titles are in the works. Those four titles are now available. And for our listeners, you can get copies of those books for your iPad or Kindle or your Nook at forgoodreason.org. Randy, as we're finishing up here, we, we talked about your international travel, the campaigns we've launched, the expose or the challenge to James von Prague. We talked about TAM, our digital publishing. Right now is what we call the season of reason at the James Randy Educational Foundation. This is part of our annual fundraising so that we can continue our efforts into 2012, even expand them. And so I want to let our listeners know that you can support the James Randi Educational Foundation by going to randy.org. And Randy, if someone contributes to our work during the season of reason, uh, we're doing something special for them, aren't we? Yeah, and if you give $100 or more, and the or more is very important there, to the JF Season of Reason campaign, our thanks will consist of, uh, well, for one thing, this uh, lady named Amy Roth, 
Uh, she represents uh, what is a Surly Ramex, yes. Right. She's a good friend of uh, J. Refs, and last year, yeah. through her generosity, of n- a number of women got to attend TAM on, yeah. on grants. But yes, you were saying th- Surly Ramex is providing... Yeah, they're providing these little uh, tree ornaments, if you still have a tree, if you're atavistic to that point. But <laughs> if you still have a tree there that isn't going to be turned into paper, but instead into a Christmas tree, uh, you can actually get one of these little red businesses. It's a, an ornament that hangs on the tree, and it's actually got a caricature of me, not looking terribly happy, but okay. it's, it says, woo, 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 happy holidays, and I'm looking very surly there, yeah. but the picture that goes along with it has me laughing right. uh, uproariously at something or other. But th- these are collector's items now, uh, DJ, as you know, and uh, people are just clamoring to get them and so if you if you make that kind of um, uh, a donation to us uh, that's what you'll get these are collectors items and uh, hundreds of JRF supporters participated in the 2011 season of reason that's and last year by, yeah. Yeah. and by doing that this year you'll add to your collection so don't miss your chance to keep your collection and the JRF going strong please folks will you Okay, so that sounded sufficiently infomercial. Thank you, Randy. The The point here is it's our way of saying thanks to folks who help support our effort to fight on reason to combat harmful pseudoscience, the same work you've been doing for decades. We want to continue doing, we want to expand, and we can't do that without folks' support. That's absolutely right. And so this is our appeal, and we hope that you'll pay some attention to it, folks. Please do. You can make a donation at randy.org. Uh, Randy, thanks for the discussion. It was good to kind of get into some of these topics about both what skepticism is, what the JREF does. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Well, it was a lot of fun, DJ, and we'll do that again very soon, I'm sure. Thank you for listening to this episode of For Good Reason. To get involved with an online conversation about today's show, join the discussion going on at forgoodreason.org. Views expressed on the show aren't necessarily the JREF's views. Questions and comments on today's show can be sent to info at forgoodreason.org. For Good Reason is produced by Thomas Donnelly and Brian Thompson and recorded from Los Angeles, California. Our music is composed for us by Emmy Award winning Gary Stockdale. Carrie Poppy contributed to today's show. I'm your host, DJ Grothy.